Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Taco bueno? Did I hear that? So, shh, 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 shh. So how is everyone today? Okay, good. So, uh, last time, last time we had just finished talking about some aspects of determinant and volumes of parallelograms and things like that. So, uh, all of that stuff that we talked about <coughs> was concepts from linear algebra, uh, though it may be a little more, I hope, it's a little more geometric. No, actually, I don't hope, but I, su I suspect that it's more geometric than you may have thought about before. Uh, so today, we're going to start... Uh, a, new, a new subject, uh, because linear algebra is not enough. Linear algebra is not enough. Rather, we're going to study multilinear <coughs> algebra, that is multilinear algebra, uh, for a little bit. We've got to figure out what that, what that is and what that means, uh, because we're going to come to a situation where we need, in a sense, things to be not just, not just linear, but we need them to be multilinear. So we'll have to We'll have to see what that means. Okay. <clears throat> so today's what, the 12th? Yes, the 12th, So the first definition. So we have a definition of a K parallelogram, parallel, it has two L's somewhere, is it there? I'm, I'm just going to put L's everywhere, parallelogram uh, in are in. I'm pretty sure that one of those double L's is not supposed to be a double. <clears throat> okay, but you, you know what I mean. So we have a, 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 a K parallelogram in RN. So here's the definition. Let V1 vectors V1, V2 up to VK <clears throat> The elements of Rn. So we might be, you know, for different values of k and n, we might be talking about three vectors in R10, or we might be talking about, uh, you know, 24 vectors in R51, something like that. <coughs> uh, the definition of the k parallelogram from this is that we'll define. P of V1, V2, dot, 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 V3 uh, as the set, sorry, <laughs> thank you, as the set T1, V1 plus T2, V2 plus dot, dot, dot plus TK, VK. Where <clears throat> zero is less or equal to TI is less or equal to one. Okay, so that's a bit uh, stilted language. What does this, what does this mean? <coughs> so in the first place, we have, we have vectors, k of them, 
V1, V2, blah, blah, all the way up to VK. And then we're multiplying each one by its own scalar. So V1 gets its scalar T1, V2 gets its scalar T2, uh, etc. So we're multiplying each, each vector by a scalar between 0 and 1, inclusive, uh, and then adding them all up. What is this? It's a linear combination of these vectors, but, but it's a restricted linear combination in the sense that the coefficients have to be between 0 and 1, right? It's not an unrestricted one. It's restricted. So if this was, if, if the values of t were unrestricted, then what would this be? It would be the span of v1 through vk, right? It would be the span. So let's understand what happens when you, <clears throat> when you have it like this. So for example, <clears throat> uh, what if we have k is 1 and <clears throat> n is 2? So how many vectors do we have? 1. And in what dimension are we having them? 2 in the plane. <clears throat> So suppose we have uh, this vector, this vector right here. Uh, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a point because if I drew the vector, it would, it would obscure what I'm trying to draw. So I'm going to draw the position that the vector is pointing to as if its tail were at the origin. So here's the vector, v1. It's a, it's a vector, and that's where its head would be pointing. So I, what we're talking about, P of V1, <clears throat> P of V1 would be the set of all scalar multiples of V1 where, where that scalar is between 0 and 1. So, so if T were 1, what point would we be talking, if T1 were 1, what point would we be talking about? That one, right? Because it would be 1 times V1. Okay, if, if T1 were 0, what point would we be talking about? The origin, right? How about if, um, if, T, if T1 were a half, what point would we be referring to? Halfway between them, right? So we'd be talking about that point. So now, I want to, so this, this point corresponds to T1 is 1. This point corresponds to T1 is 0. This point corresponds to T1 is a half. So I want, I want the set of, of all possible. So what are we talking about? This line segment, right? That's what we're talking about. That's, that's P. That's P. And in, so you, you, you're, you're calling this a line segment, and I, I don't disagree. But, but, uh, I'm going to call it a one-dimensional parallelogram. <coughs> it's, a, it's, it's a one parallelogram. A, para, a parallelogram whose dimensionality is one. Okay, any question about this? Okay, so let's try, let's try k, k is 2 and n is 2. So how many vectors do we have? 2, in what dimension do we have them? R2. R2. <laughs> so again, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to draw two vectors now, but I'm just going to draw where their heads would be because otherwise it would be in the way. Well, actually, this way, this way is not too bad. This time it won't be too bad. So suppose that this is V1. 
and we have another vector v2. So now what is the parallel of, what is, what is P of V1, V2? Exactly, exactly. Let's think about this for a moment. Let's think about this. Where would, uh, <laughs> where would, where would half of V1 be? It'd be right there, right? So, so this, that right there, that's not, that's not very close to half, is it? I can do better than that. So that right there would be half of V1, right? So then we could add uh, half of V1, and to that we could add, say, uh, all of V2, and obtain that point right there. That'd be, that'd be half of V1 and all of V2, so we could get that point. What if we wanted to get to this point right here? About how much would we have to do? That'd be half of V1 and about half of V2, wouldn't it? So, so what, P is saying, what P is saying is that you can fill in this entire parallelogram, that whole thing, by taking linear, linear combinations of V1 and V2, but the coefficients each have to be between 0 and 1. Okay? So now, I did it in, uh, I did one vector in two dimensions, I did two vectors in two dimensions. So, so one vector in three dimensions is exactly the same. It's a little line segment, but now it's you know, potentially pointing out in the middle of space. Okay, and then you can have a two-dimensional parallelogram, like a little dart that's floating around in three space. Okay, so any question about, about this notation? Yes? Is it wrong to say these are just subspaces with limits and bounds? They're not subspaces, and the reason why they're not subspaces is because uh, if, for example, you were to add V1 to its subspaces must be additive, yes. if you were to add V1 to itself, it, you, you'd come over here. So it's definitely not a subspace. But what, what it is, is it's, is it's, well, it's a parallelogram. Okay. Yes? Uh, was it stated that um, K has to be left hand okay, Can you have three vectors in, in R2 and it would still make a parallelogram? Well, let me think about that for just a second. <laughs> just a second. <laughs> it, it surely would, but now I'm trying to think. Zero and one. Yeah, it would still be a parallelogram, but but what it would be is you could you could simplify you could simplify it by taking any two of the three and combining them, yeah, yeah. and then. It was but it would still be a parallelogram. So technically speaking, it still works. But yes, in my head, I was thinking k less or equal to n. Okay, good. So we have, uh, we have parallelograms. So now, definition. Now we have an anchored and sometimes it's also called a located located parallel uh, k parallelogram so strictly speaking we were we were drawing those parallelograms on the previous page uh, with with both vec with both vectors having their tail at the origin but that is uh, is not strictly necessary. So now we're going to have uh, a, an anchored or located k parallelogram. So we'll, I'll say let let p of v1 
v2 dot 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 vk be a k parallelogram in Rn and let x be an Rn. Okay, then what what the anchored or located k parallel parallelogram will be, it'll be the normal k parallelogram, but all the tails of the vectors will be having uh, having their position at x. Then px <coughs> of v1, v2, v3, uh, n, k, k. Uh, is PV1, V2, V3, uh, I keep writing 3, somehow I have that on the brain, uh, and then plus X, where this is a set, okay, and then, so I'm saying set plus a vector, and I hope you understand what I mean by that, is that every element of that set is being translated by X. So, <clears throat> For example, we could have that this is position x, that this is position x, so that's its location, and then we can put <coughs> a vector here like this, v1, and then the parallelogram, the anchored parallelogram, is this whole assemblage. So it's all of these points together. Px, v1. So it's referring to all those points. Okay, so it's a way to say that I'm talking about a specific parallelogram that's located at a specific position. Similarly, So this would be px, that one's missing its hat, v1, v2. Okay, so uh, one thing to, to immediately get out of the way is, well, parallelograms, for example, this parallelogram uh, has a two volume. So I'm gonna call it a two volume because I'm going to stop using the special words. So like, what's the, what's the special name that we have for one-dimensional volume? Length. Length. And then what's the special name for two-dimensional volume? Area. Area. And what's the special name for three-dimensional volume? volume? Volume. Okay, so I'm just going to stop calling that. I'm going to call it K volume. So this has a two volume. And suppose that I change its anchor. That is to say, suppose I change its X. How is the two volume modified? It isn't, right? That's the outstanding thing about, one of the outstanding things about volume is that if this particular parallelogram has uh, two volume equal to six, then that one also has two volume equal to six, and so does that one, right? They all do. Good. <clears throat> Any question about that? Yes? N, thank you, K parallelogram. So this, this N until seconds ago was absent. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so you might be wondering, why are we gonna be so interested in parallelograms? Okay, so your previous class, 
let, what, what, what calculus class was immediately before this one? Was it 2419? For some people, for 15 for others. Okay, so in that class, in that class, uh, you learned about surface area of surfaces. Okay, so <clears throat> the way that works, the way that works is you take a function, And it's defined on some set. So when you want to draw such a, a surface, you always got to start out by making yourself a nice grid. Then what I do is I draw a completely stereotyped version of this function. I make, at each corner, I make four legs of more or less random height. And so now I have four legs. And now you connect each legs that, that go together with wavy lines. So the kind of thing I'd like for you to imagine is something like a bed sheet. Okay? That's been, that's been flung up into the air. Okay, <clears throat> so now if we, if we uh, wanted to compute the surface area of this, the way that you do that is you take this domain down here, you take this domain down here and cut it into little rectangles. You cut it into little rectangles. Uh, so for example, like, uh, like these rectangles. Now, I'm saying that these are rectangles, but they don't look like rectangles. Why not? Because it's in perspective, right? But those little things are, are rectangles. Those little, little things are rectangles. And then if I single out my favorite one, say this one, and try and watch where does that little piece of domain go on the function, so it ends up going up here. And you get a little piece that looks like this. <clears throat> so this piece down here corresponds to that piece up there. So now, because this one is at an angle, because this was on a smooth surface, it's, it's not flat. But if we were to make the domain, the, the mesh down here, the rectangles down here very, very small, then what would, th what would this start to become? It would start to become flat in the sense that calculus is, is how you try and treat everything as being flat. So in the limit, in the limit, these are parallelograms. So in the limit, these are parallelograms. So when you were when you were in 24, 15, or 19, when you were thinking about surface area, liter literally what you were doing is you were you were cutting the surface into infinitely many infinitesimal parallelograms. You were you were saying to yourself, ah, it looks like parallelograms everywhere I look, and you find that you find the area of each individual parallelogram, and then you sum them up with an integral. So surface area, as far as mathematicians are concerned, it's not too much to say that surfaces are literally infinitely many infinitesimal parallelograms. Okay. Another topic that you had to study that you had to study in calculus um, <clears throat> 2415 or 2419 is arc length. Okay, you had to study the arc length problem. So in this case, it's even easier to draw. You've got some parametrized curve. Okay, then how do you, how do you solve the arc length problem? Sorry? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> We're going to linearize it. But how, so, so can someone tell us how you could come up with an estimate for the arc length of the thing I've drawn here? Yeah. 
Okay, so I think what you're saying is take that point and maybe that point and that point and these, these other points and here. The right. So now all those points that I selected, all those points that, I'm, that I selected, I'm, gonna, I'm going to put straight lines between them. And what I want you to understand is that those little line segments, we've been, you've been calling them line segments. They are line segments. But now we have a new name for them. What are they? One They're one parallelograms. They, and, and also secants. <laughs> They're one parallelograms. And they have a one volume, which is to say length. They, they, they have these things. So where length is concerned, the arc length of a curve, it's not too much to say that from the mathematical point of view, all curves are actually infinitely many infinitesimal one parallelograms. So a two-dimensional object is, can be cons can, that's smooth anyway, can be construed as consisting of infinitely many infinitesimal two parallelograms, this one infinitely many infinitesimal one parallelograms, three-dimensional objects infinitely many infinitesimal three parallelograms, and generally a k-dimensional object consisting of infinitely many infinitesimal k-dimensional parallelograms. So the battle cry is everything's, everything is just a bunch of parallelograms. So we've got to be able to talk about them um, fluently. There's my notes. When you say uh, k-dimension as decimal, parallelograms, do you mean k minus one parallelograms? I mean, I mean a k-dimensional object. And that k-dimensional object might be sitting inside of an n-dimensional space in the sense that this space that we're looking at is three-dimensional, but this bed sheet surface thing is two-dimensional. If you were a little bitty creature and you were standing on it, you, you could only look in two directions. You, you, you couldn't leave it. Whereas this is sitting inside of a two-dimensional space because I'm construing this as the space. But this is a one-dimensional object, because if you lived on the red world, you could only look left and right. So a one-dimensional object sitting inside <coughs> of two-dimensional space, two-dimensional sitting inside three, etc. Yeah? Uh, for that anchor, that uh -huh. I don't see how uh, you're adding the x vector to all the individual vectors. So what I mean, what I mean is that all of, is that all of those, uh, if, if the anchor wasn't there, you could consider them all to be anchored at the origin. And so what I'm saying is just add x to all of those points. So it just, it's a translation. Okay. But it's not vector addition. Well, what I wrote was a, was a set plus a vector. Okay. Yeah, so what I mean by that is that every element in that set has x added to it. So it would be x plus t1, v1, t2, v2, all the way down the line. <coughs> OK. <coughs> so that means that uh, we can now give a name. The unsigned volume. of a k parallelogram in Rn, unsigned volume of a k parallelogram in Rn. So the volume, k volume, of P, V1, V2, Vk, so we want to know the volume of this thing. So I claim that actually you could, you could tell me right now. You already know it. What is the volume, the formula? Square root. Square root. So do I have enough room over here? Probably not. Maybe. If I write small. Square root of determinant of what? Transpose, right? And, and then this one, uh, VK. 
So now we're just giving names to these things that we talked about uh, last time. So one of your homework exercises that's due Thursday has something to do with has something to do with this. What are you supposed to do? Sorry. So there, so right, but there's there's two parameters here, in in K. And what is the homework exercise about? When when n is two and k is two. So in the specific case that n is two and k is two, then this formula simplifies to something nice, er. Okay, good. Any question about this? Okay, so a synonym. <coughs> A synonym for reasons that aren't clear yet for the K volume uh, for the what am I trying to say for the N volume in RN <coughs> so now I'd like for you to know that now, now it's now the parameters agree it's not K and n, it's n and n. A synonym for this <coughs> is going to be absolute value dx n, uh, dnx. <coughs> okay, so now I hope that you have a have a slight echo of that kind of looks like the differential in uh, when you're doing integration. Kind of looks like dx a little bit. Okay, so what I'm all I'm saying is that these two things are synonyms when n is k. Okay. <clears throat> so now I have a question for you. Or let, let's make it a uh, remark. So we had a homework exercise that was asking whether or not certain spaces were homogeneous or additive. Okay, we already turned that in, right? Okay. So, I have a question. Just looking at a picture now. So, by this red line, I mean the line that goes all the way. So is this, is this red line, it, it, the set indicated by this red line, is that a homogeneous set? It is. Is it an additive set? Yes, because, because if you were, well, the simplest reason is that it's flat <laughs> and going through the origin. So not only, so it's even better than both of these. It's the combination of these. What, what is this? Linear. It's linear. So what, what I have drawn here is both, is both homogeneous and additive. Now, what if, what if we were to draw another line, and I want you to consider the set that, that consists of all the red points and also all the green points. It, it has all of them in it. So now, is this set additive? Why not? Sorry? Okay, that's, that's a good way to think of it. Think of, think of any, any little red vector that's parallel to the red and any little green vector parallel to the green. Then the span of those two vectors should be the whole space. Okay, so if we, if we try and be very specific, so how about what if we were to add, say, this vector, that one, and I just indicated to say this one. So those are, those are two points, that one and that one. If you add them together, where do you go? You come to about right here. Okay, so, so is, is the red and green when, when considered together additive? It is not. Because if you add together a red point and a green point, then you leave the set. So it's not additive. Is it homogeneous? 
It is homogeneous. It is homogeneous because suppose I select this particular red point right here. And then suppose I take that red point and multiply it by half. Where will I go? And about right there. Still, still a red point. Okay, because if you consider just the red points, if you multiply any one of the red points by a scalar, you'll still be red. Okay, what if we take a green point and we multiply a green point by a scalar? We still have a green point, right? So is this set homogeneous? Mm -hmm. It is homogeneous. In fact, in fact, you can take any amount of lines that you want. So let's put another one through there, because why not? So is that a homogeneous set? Sure it is. Homogeneous sets have this kind of shape. They look like little stars. That's what homogeneity looks like. OK. <clears throat> if that's what homogeneity looks like, then what does additivity look like? If you were to try and visualize it. What, what, I heard someone saying something. They look kind of like parallelograms, but not, not, not really parallelograms. That's not, don't want to be confusing. It's not the edges, and it's not the interior. Rather, it's all the corners. All the corners of a parallelogram. So what I mean to say is suppose that we have any old vector, red vector, and some other vector that we'll call green vector. Uh, let's make it taller. Okay. So then, <clears throat> now to make this set an additive set, to make it additive, that means that, uh, well, if the green vector is in the set and the red vector is in the set, what else must be in the set? Green plus red. So that means that the, that, that point right there must be in the set. Right? Okay, that must be in the set. So must, so must uh, green plus red plus red. That point must be in there. Okay, so must, mm, say, red plus green. But that's just the same point, right? But so must red plus red. and then red plus green, and also green plus green, which I'm falling off the edge. So what I want you to imagine, what I want you to imagine is that we continue going that way, and that way, and that way, and we're looking at all the corners of these parallelograms, individual points, like this one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. And they keep going that way and that way, and, and individual points. So, yes? Does that also continue in the negative or just it, it Strictly speaking, it doesn't. You, you could continue it. If you continued it even one step going this way, then you'd have to go all the way. Because, because uh, additivity just means you add them together. Just means you add them together. So, such a, such a shape is usually called a lattice, a lattice of points. So the homework exercise was, well, consider all of the, consider all of the points with non-negative integer coordinates, with natural coordinates. Okay, so all of the points on the, in the top right of the plane. If you add those together, you still get one. It's a lattice. So the, the thing is, is this is homogeneity and this is additivity. And when you take these together, you get something that's flat, like a plane. OK, so now I have uh, another remark. OK, and the remark is that, uh, so this, is, this, this question about homogeneity and additivity, this is, um, was a question about sets. Is this set homogene homogeneous? Is this set additive? Another question is I could ask, well, is a function 
homogeneous and is a function additive. Okay, so in that case, what that means is that you look at the you look at the <coughs> image of of the function. So you could you could graph it and then ask the same question: Is it star shaped? If it's star shaped, it's homogeneous. Is it lattice shaped? If it's lattice shaped, it's additive. If it has both, it's a linear function. Okay. So, here's the question. Is f of x equal to the absolute value of x linear? So is it linear? <coughs> linear function. No. It isn't. It isn't. Uh, there's, a, there's a multitude of reasons why it isn't, right? <laughs> So, uh, in the first place, let's consider its shape. If you were to look at it, if you look at its plot, then it looks like this. Okay, so is it homogeneous? It isn't homogeneous. Why, why is this red set that we're looking at not a homogeneous set? Right, because if, if I'm pointing here at that vector, I should be able to multiply it by negative 1 and still get a red point. But if I multiply that point, this vector that I'm pointing to, by negative 1, then I'm down here, and I've left, I've left the red set. So this is not homogeneous. Is this an additive set? No, right, because, for example, if I add these two points together, these two symmetric points together, then I get a point on the y-axis. Okay, so, so absolute value is not linear. So here's my question. Is, is uh, the volume, k-volume, linear? So is it, is it linear? <clears throat> Could it possibly be? So let's make this question a little easier. Is, is the n volume on Rn linear? So what do you think? n volume on Rn. Now we know a special case about this. This is a special case when n when this and this are in agreement. So I'm talking about, for example, the two volume in R2 or the three volume in R3. So is this linear? It can, but I'm not talking, it, notably, notably, this is not the signed volume. This is not the signed, this is the unsigned volume. So, so what's the special case when N is in, uh, sorry, when K is in? It's absolute value, right? So then the n volume would be absolute value of determinant So is this linear? No, it's not linear. It's not linear in the end. The simplest reason is just, well, absolute value is not linear. Absolute value is not linear, so you could, it couldn't possibly uh, be linear. Okay, so here's the deal. We desperately need something like this to be linear. Otherwise, otherwise we're not going to be able to do what we want. This is not linear, so it won't do the job that we need. We desperately need something like it. So... <clears throat> So we have this signed volume. So what about <coughs> determinant as signed volume? Is it linear?
So to be specific, to be specific, uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask about it in the following way. Suppose that uh, we consider uh, the first question. So is it true, is it true that the determinant of, say, not t because there's a t in determinant and that would be confusing. How about <clears throat> ax, y? So just we ha we'll just deal with two by two matrices for a moment. Two two vectors, so two by two matrix. Uh, this is a uh, vector in R two. This is a vector in R two. That's a scalar. So if we consider just the first argument, I'm asking, is it true that we could factor that scalar out? So is that true? Y'all did determinants in linear algebra, right? Just one of them. Two by two. Okay. Okay. So if if you can imagine it algebraically, fine, right? You 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 multiply the first column by a, and then do the the difference of the product of the diagonals, and then okay, it'll work. So I want to give you I want to give you a geometric reason why this should still work. Why this should still work. Okay. Well, what if what if x is this vector? So first x and then y. Because remember, we already discussed that determinant is the signed area of a parallelogram. So now, in the style of plotting that I'm requesting for you to do on your homework. Now I'm going to complete the parallelogram and I'm going to draw it in this way. So if that's x, then what's this one? This is negative x. And this is, what is this one? Negative y. Okay, and then what's the what is the orientation of this particular one? Is it clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. Okay. So now, suppose that I take this picture and I multiply x, the red one, by some scalar a. And for, for definiteness, let's imagine that a is 2. What would that do to the red vector? It would make it twice as long, right? So if we take the red vector and we just make it longer, a times as long, so that this is ax. So that's ax. And now we add to it this y. <coughs> y. And then subtract from it. X. Oops. So if that's if that a were exactly two, do you see that I could put one and then another one right next to it? The area would be exactly twice as big. Okay, and that works for that works for any scalar. <clears throat> Any scalar at all. So now, I have a different question. Supposing that, what if we, so this is, for example, this is what it would look like when a is 2. What would it look like when a is negative 1? Then it would, it would take this and flip it around. So let's draw that one. So, so instead of x being pointed this way, x would be pointed this way. So negative x, and then to that, we'll add y, because remember, it's always heads to tails. So here's y now. And then what's negative negative x? 
right, but to be stilted, I'll do this. <clears throat> and if I could draw perfectly, then what would, be, what would be the relation between the unsigned areas of these two? They'd be exactly the same, but then what is the orientation of this one? Opposite, right? So, so if you multiply by a negative scalar, does it, really, does it really negate the signed area? It really does. And if you multiply by, say, some scalar that's, uh, say, bigger than one, does it really make the area that much bigger? It really does. Okay, so, so the determinant is homogeneous. Uh, but I'd like for you to note that it's homogeneous for this column, and if it's homogeneous for that column, then it's homogeneous for all the columns, right? Because there was nothing particularly special about X. I could have done all these drawings, or you could, if, in, if you like, do all these formulas, and it would work just the same for the other one. So I could move the A to the Y, or even I could move it outside. I can move this A to any position. Okay, so the determinant is, is homogeneous in the sense that you can multiply any one of the columns by a scalar and then factor that scalar out. Okay, is the determinant additive? Is determinant additive? So again, we'll restrict ourselves to the two by two case so I can give you a drawing. This is another thing that you do know from linear algebra. So my question is, what about the determinant of vector x plus y? So this is in the first column. This is the first column. And then the second column is z. Is this equal to the determinant of of what should I write to get to determinant of x, z, right? And then what? Plus determinant of y, z. So again, we're checking linearity, but we're just restricting ourselves to the first column. So is this true? Is this true? So one thing you could do is you could take the two by two matrix formula and you could do it all, right, with just coordinates and it would be some big slog where you've got to multiply and collect and all this stuff. You could do it. Let, let's not. Okay? Let's see if we can reason, reason this out sort of geometrically again. Okay. Well, suppose that this is x. This is vector x, and this one vector y. Then, uh, no, I want this to be, sorry, I want this one to be z. <coughs> z. Wait a second. No, I had it right the first time. I'm so sorry. I apologize. <laughs> sorry. So x plus y. Uh, that would be that. So, and then let's do x plus z. So if this is z, so that's for this one. Then for, for this one's parallelogram, what would I have to do from z? Add negative x. So let's do that. And then from, from negative x, where do we go? Negative z. So that one would be like so. OK, now ignore the red and blue, and let's do green and red. So now we want to do y plus z. So here's y, and then now we need to go z. OK, so ignoring. Ignoring that one for a moment. What do we do from y plus z? Now what? Y. Now we do negative y. <clears throat> so 
And then from negative y, what do we do? Negative z. So that one's going, is another red one. And these are really on top of each other, but I'm drawing them side by side because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see them. So one of them's going one way, the other's going the other way. But all the red bits are parallel to each other. Now what I want you to imagine is that we take this shape, which is one parallelogram and another, and I want you to imagine that we look at it like this, and I can cover that one up, and suppose I start pushing on this z right here, and I shear it up so that these, the distance right here stays the same, but I push it up like you would straighten up a stack of paper that was leaning over. Then what will happen if we shear the, this, this parallelogram that way? It's, it's two volume will be the same. And then what would happen if we uh, also sheared this one that way? The volume would stay the same. So, so, where is x plus y? Where, on this diagram, where would you draw x plus y? So x plus y, it would go from this point to that point, right? So let's, let's draw this diagram again. So here's x, here's y, and now let's draw x plus y. So this is x plus y. And what I want to do is I want to shear all of this until it's, until it's, uh, hitting the other x plus y on the other side. So from here, <coughs> I draw a y, <coughs> and no, a z, that's what comes next. Okay, now I'm gonna go back by x plus y. then back down by z. So what I did is I, I straightened out, <laughs> I took this bent piece and pushed it that way, shearing it until it was this straight piece, and the shear ch doesn't change the area. So my question to you is, is this much area that I'm shading in, how is it related to this much area? is exactly the same. And what does that have to do with this question? Sorry? They're the same. So this one, this one, is which one? What is this one? This is the bottom one. And what is, what is this one? Is the, yeah, it's the left half. And what's this one? the right half. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, yeah. Determinant is additive when you consider the additivity in one, one, uh, one column at a time. But there's nothing special about the first column. We could have done it with the second one also. Okay. <coughs> now here's the last thing. And this is where we get something a little bit different is 3, I want you to observe that, that determinant is anti-symmetric. In the following sense. That the determinant of xy, how is that related to the determinant of yx? How it, so I, I'm not quite finished here. My question is, is how, are, how can I make this right? By negating it. By negating it. So this is, this is something that you, uh, you know, it's by rote from linear algebra. But why, why should it be this way? Because the orientation flips. Right? This one says do x first. 
then do y, then do the opposite of x, then do the opposite of y. And at least the way that I drew it for this one, the orientation is counterclockwise. Well, what is this one saying? This one is saying do x first. What is this one saying? It's saying do y first. So it's saying first go with y. From y, do x. And then to complete the parallelogram, opposite of y, opposite of x. <clears throat> and if I was a perfect artist, these would be exactly the same. But the only point that matters is that what is the orientation of this that I just drew? Clockwise. So why does, why does switching columns in the determinant change the sign? Because it changes the orientation of this. It makes it change from one to the other. OK, so, so determinant is a really interesting function. You can think of it, in general, as a, a k by k determinant. Determinant of a k by k matrix can be construed as taking k vectors in RK, and it's <coughs> homogeneous in every column. It's additive in every column. And it's anti-symmetric when you switch any two columns. And this is going to turn out to be so important, so important, that we're going to give functions that have those three properties, that they're homogeneous in every column and additive in every column. We're going to call those multilinear. So not, not just linear, but linear in all the columns, linear in all of them. And this anti-symmetry, we're just going to call that anti-symmetric. So we're going to be interested in multilinear anti-symmetric functions. So here's the definition. So now we're in the books section 6.1. And this section is called differential forms. And the first definition is K form on Rn. A K form on Rn. So in the first place, in the first place, uh, it ha it is a function with signature. Rn to K to R. So now that's kind of stilted math language. Could someone put this in plain language? So in the first place, it's a function. How many, are, how many, in, uh, how many inputs does it take? <coughs> k. It takes k numbers, uh, k uh, vectors. And what size are those vectors? Are in. And then what kind of thing does it produce? Scalar. A scalar. OK. So now, determinant is going to be an example of this where it's k and k. So, it's, so that the result is, uh, can be written as a square matrix. So it has to have signature uh, n to k uh, like that. And it has to be multilinear. <coughs> and also anti-symmetric. OK. So first comment is that 
determinant is uh, such a form. on Rn to N to R. And so notably, you have to have N and N have to be in agreement. <coughs> okay, two is uh, in volume on Rn. such a K form. Is it something that does that? So it, it can't be. Why can it not be? Because, well, because it's not linear, right? It it's, ends up being neither one of them. It's neither additive nor homogeneous Okay, in, in any of the columns. So the answer is no. <coughs> And the simplest answer is just that absolute value is not linear. So now we want to have an example. What do, what do K forms look like? What do K forms look like? You know one. You know the determinant. But now we're going to have an example that shows you what every single possible K form looks like. All the things that can be multilinear and, and anti-symmetric. <coughs> okay. Uh, remark. Let uh, V1, V2, Vk be elements of Rn. And let I1, I2, IK be uh, integers from 1 to n. What I mean is that each one of these needs to be a value between 1 and n. They could all be 1. They could all be n. They could be, uh, it could be one and one and one and then a bunch of threes all the way to the end. So, so all of those uh, have to be between one and n. <coughs> then the function that we'll denote dx i1, and then now we're writing a new symbol for the first time. So this uh, is a pointy looking thing, kind of looks like a, less than symbol turned to it on its side. Uh, it's pronounced wedge. So dx, dx i1 wedge, dx i2 wedge, dot, 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 wedge, dx i k is <coughs> the function. which takes this matrix V1 to VK. So now, this is a matrix where we've stacked all the VK side by side by side. What are the dimensions of this matrix? N by K, right? So N rows. So this is N by K. Now, if n were not k, would we be able to compute a determinant? No, no right? Because, because we can only do it with, with square determinants. Uh, sorry, with square, with square matrices. You can only compute determinants of square matrices. So what we're going to do, what this function is going to do, is it's going to take this matrix, and it, which is rectangular, and we're going to do our best to make, make it a square matrix. It takes this matrix, <coughs> selects rows 
I1 to IK. So how many rows is that? K rows. So that means that we're going to select just those rows. So we're going to select a square subset of this rectangular matrix. And then computes determinant. Uh, maybe I can write it on the same page. And computes determinant of the result. So because determinant is homogeneous and additive and anti-symmetric, so is this rule. This, this is a rule to generate a multilinear anti-symmetric uh, k-form. And what's going to be neat is that there's going to be no others. This is the only kind that you can make. Yes? This only works when k is less than n. That's true. It only works when k. Why would it only work if k is uh, less than n? So it would be like saying if we have a very wide rectangle. <laughs> right. Then, but that's not how this rule works. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see why uh, why that is next time, why, why, why we can still make sense of this. Okay, so have a nice uh, whatever day it is.